Well, good morning and happy Easter to you. My name is Dion. I'm one of the teaching pastors here. And I don't know about you, but uh, this, this whole ID thing, that, that title package, just all the, all the theming for this new series that we begin today, it reminds me a whole lot of CSI. Anyone else kind of getting the CSI vibe on, on this whole thing? It's a, it's a little bit creepy, and yet it's, it's kind of appropriate for Easter. I'll talk about that in a minute. But just out of curiosity, how many of you like the show CSI? Or, or I should say, how many of you like any of the dozen copycat shows that are basically CSI, whatever you call them. I mean, if you like those shows, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are a ton of them, right? And, and, and they're all kind of the same. They all have these beautiful detectives, better, than, better looking than the average person. Uh, they're all living kind of the, the high life on a public servant's salary, mind you, somehow. They, they work that out. And they're all solving mysteries. They're cluing together different crimes, putting together uh, evidence from, from gruesome things or just mysterious things, things that no one, no one would be able to easily uh, figure out. But, but they're able to do it so simply with just a little bit of luminol, you know, that stuff under the black light, and a keen sense of perception. And of course, most of all, what must really do it in those shows are the cool sunglasses that they wear, right? That'll do it all for you. Now, if you like those shows, that there's no problem with that. Um, in fact, we all love mystery, and I think that's why we love those shows. But even before there were those shows, there were other shows. There were shows like Columbo. Anyone like Columbo? Yeah. Matlock, good old Ben Matlock, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Or uh, Kojak. Remember him, Kojak? <laughs> we got the Kojak fan club, I think, over here. I think I heard them. Uh, Kojak. My personal favorite, my personal favorite when it comes to mystery-solving TV shows was Scooby-Doo. You went down with Scooby-Doo? <laughs> Nothing like Scooby-Doo. But before there were TV shows, uh, there were other things. There were like the board game, the board game Clue. Anyone love to play Clue? Right? Colonel Mustard in the conservatory with a wrench. We just got a new version of that game. It's not quite as good as the old one, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a great mystery-solving game. Or if you like to read, there were, there were a whole series of Agatha Christie novels or Sherlock Holmes novels, which just again shows us that we are a people, no matter what age we're living in, who love mystery. And maybe that's why we love Easter. Well, on top of all the other things we love about Easter, like the bunny and the candy and the good food and the family, but, but maybe one of the reasons we love Easter so much is because Easter is a holiday that is big on mystery. We're going to talk about this, this morning, just about the mystery that, that surrounded that first Easter morning. But this mystery wasn't cracked by some cool guys wearing sunglasses driving, driving around in Hummers. This mystery was solved by none other than the oris, original super sleuths known as the disciples. Not quite as cool, are they? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're kind of missing some of the, uh, the vibe. But in fact, these disciples who were trying to piece together the great mystery of what happened to Jesus on Easter morning, they aren't so good at detective work. I don't think that's why Jesus called them to be disciples. In fact, they, they're terrible at it. Don't call these people if you have a mystery to solve. They are not your people. Because the first Easter is a total debacle as far as detective work goes. I'd like to show you this, exactly what I'm talking about. We're going to go to John chapter 20, and we're going to look at the first Easter, that Easter morning. And uh, as we're going through this, I just want you to kind of keep your mind out, your eyes out rather, uh, for uh, clues. Clues that should have been obvious communicating what had actually happened on Easter, clues that many of the disciples missed. So John chapter 20, this is what it looks like. It says, on the early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene, one of the disciples, uh, went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved. And she said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed, although they still didn't understand from Scripture, that Jesus had to rise from the dead. 
Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. So, so you get this? It's a mystery here. And do you see how the disciples approach it? If, if not, let me help you out here. We start off with Mary Magdalene. She's the first one to the tomb early on Easter morning. And she's there presumably to take care of Jesus' body who was hastily put in this tomb on Friday before the Sabbath. And so she, she arrives there at the tomb and she notices the first bit of evidence that the stone has been rolled away. Now Mary and others had seen the stone be put in place and it had been sealed and guards had been placed there. So, so this is out of the ordinary. This is certainly worthy of an investigation. And yet Mary, she sees this bit of evidence and, and she doesn't really investigate. Maybe, maybe she looks into the tomb long enough to notice that Jesus isn't in there. But, but then it says she runs back to tell the disciples and, and she knows what happened in her mind. She's got it all figured out. She solved the mystery. Someone has stolen his body. That's what she tells the disciples. She goes back and she says, hey guys, someone has taken Jesus' body. I don't know where he is. And that's where we get introduced to uh, Peter, Simon Peter. We'll just call him Peter. And the other disciple, it says, the disciple that Jesus loved, likely uh, John, the guy who wrote down this, this account, this testimony. So Peter and John, they hear this. And of course, they're the big men on campus. So they're going to go and take care of this stuff. You know, the stuff that the woman couldn't handle. They're going to go handle it for her because they're going to they're get to the bottom of this. So, so they go running off toward the tomb. And interestingly, we find out that John is way faster than Peter, which I find an odd bit of detail to record. I, Maybe it was just John showing off. You know, that was like his glory days. And he's like, hey, just by the way, I was w way faster than Peter. He may be more famous, but I was faster. Peter was pounding the falafel and was a little slow in his older years, I guess. So John, he runs to the tomb first and he gets there first. And, and, and he doesn't go in, but, but he looks in and he notices the second clue. He notices the strips of linen. Now, now think about this for a second. These strips of linen were used to wrap up a body, wrap up a corpse, kind of an embalming method, kind of like mummies, you know. Uh, that's what these strips of linen were used for. And now, now think about this for a second. If you were going to take a corpse and move it, if you were going to steal a body, would you really unwrap a decomposing body first before you were going to move it? I don't think you would. So, so, so John's looking in there, and, and he sees the linen, but he doesn't go in. And then Peter comes along, you know, he <laughs> huffing and puffing to the scene, going like, I got to lose some weight after Easter, right? Um, <laughs> Peter shows up, and, and he runs straight into the tomb. He goes into the tomb, no respect, no respect for the integrity of the crime scene. He just kind of, you know, clumsily steps in there, and he sees the linen, but then he also sees something else. He sees this head cloth. Now, again, the head cloth, more linen. What's this about? Why would you take that off a, a dead body? Same question. But, but, but notice what it said. It said that the, the head cloth, the cloth wrapped around his head, was separate from the other linen, still in its place. Which, again, is kind of weird. Not just why would you unwrap the head of a corpse, but, but it's like the head cloth wasn't moved. It wasn't disturbed. It was still right where it was when Jesus' body was laid in the tomb. It's almost as if... Jesus' body just disappeared from within it, and the cloth was just left there, undisturbed. So, so Peter sees that. Then John gets bold enough, I guess, to come into the tomb too. So John comes into the tomb, and they both take a big look around, and that's the moment, right? That's the moment where they deduce on the basis of all of this evidence that Jesus had, in fact, been raised from the dead. No, <laughs> that's not what happens. It does say that John believed, but it says that neither one of them really understood from Scripture what, needed, what, what this uh, was all about and why this had to happen. What it says, in fact, is they take one good look around the scene, and then they pack it up and go home. <laughs> Do you notice that? Verse 10, it says, uh, Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. They leave. No further investigation, no all-out search for the risen Jesus. They just go back home. They're stumped. They don't know what to do. Now, I don't know about you, but I mean, this is terrible detective work, don't you think? I mean, here Jesus orchestrated this great resurrection surprise. And, 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 and they're just killing Jesus all over again because, like, no one's biting on the surprise here. They're all just, like, too thick, too dumb to get it. It's like a surprise party going all wrong. And Jesus must be going like, hey, will someone notice me? He's come look for me. Here I am. I'm hiding. Come find me, right? And these guys are going back home. Now, now they leave, Peter and John leave, but Mary actually stays around. Good, good old Mary, you know, like send the guys home and, and handle it, you know. Doing a job done well, get a woman involved, I guess, right? Uh, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over again to look into the tomb. And this time she saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. 
They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. So, so the next thing is, is you get two angels who show up in the tomb. They weren't there before. They're there the next moment. Two guys dressed in white at the head and the foot of where the body would be. I mean, this should be pretty compelling, but, but Mary's not impressed at all. She just wants to find out where they put Jesus' body. She, she doesn't get it. It goes on. Gets even better. At this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Like, hey. <laughs> Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go get him. So I love this. Jesus himself shows up, stands outside of the tomb. And, uh, and he says, hey, Mary, you looking for me? And she's like, out of my way, gardener. I'm looking for where they put dead Jesus. These guys are so dumb. Like, seriously. I mean, like, this, this is a child could put this together. This is truly elementary dear Watson. I mean, this is an easy case to solve. When Jesus stands there alive and is waving at Mary, all, you know, all doubt should go out the window. And see, I haven't even told you the greatest piece of evidence yet, the, the piece of evidence that Jesus gave them long ago, his own words. Long before this day ever came, before Good Friday even, Jesus spoke plainly about everything that would happen to him to these same disciples. I'll show you. Luke chapter 9. He said, the Son of Man, that's a title for himself. They understood that. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed. Got that? But on the third day, read this with me, be raised to life. I mean, here Jesus says in plain speech, clearly, I'm going to die. I'm going to be killed. But on the third day, I will be raised to new life. He gives them that in advance, a play-by-play -play of all of the events of Holy Week and Easter. And these guys are simply not listening. They, they don't believe it. How, how could they not put this mystery together? When Jesus' words are so clear, right? It's frustrating. It's dumb. Like, how, how can you guys not get this? Well, let me ask you, what about us? See, there are things that God has spoken clearly to us, and I believe that. Maybe you believe that with me, that in the Bible, we've got God's words spoken clearly to us. And if you don't believe that, that's okay. If you don't believe that the Bible is God's word, if you believe it's just the words of men, here's my challenge I'd give to you, just like, like Steve Howard gave to you a moment ago. I challenge you just to read it. Because I think when you do, you'll discover that there is wisdom and insight into human nature, into humanity, into how the world works, that is just, just beyond human wisdom. It, it is truly divine. So if you don't believe that it's God's word, that's okay. I do. And, and here's what I like to say to those of you who also believe that it's God's word is that there are things that God has spoken clearly to us, so clearly, plain as day, and yet we also struggle to believe them, don't we? I mean, what about when God says, I forgive you? I mean, God says this in the Bible a dozen different times or more, a dozen different ways. He says, as far as the east is from the west, so far I've removed your sins from you. He says, I've taken your sins and I've buried them in the heart of the sea. They're gone, they're done. He says, I'll remember your sins no more. I'll forget them. Man, it is so clear. Jesus from the cross says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I mean, the fact that God forgives us, it is plain as day. And yet, and yet, when you really mess up in life, when you really hurt someone, when you make a big mistake, how easy is it to imagine that you have made yourself unforgivable? In spite of the clear word that you're forgiven, it's not so easy, is it? Or what about when God says death is defeated? I mean, that's what Easter is all about, right? Death is defeated, not just for Jesus, but for anyone who is in Christ, anyone who trusts in Jesus. Death is defeated. We know that death is what takes us to be with God forever, that, that death has no sting, it has no victory anymore, and, and yet... When we lose someone we love, how often do we, do we forget these words or, or fail to believe these words and we can only see the tragedy? I mean, grief is okay. Grief is normal. And yet how many of us get paralyzed by a sense of loss? Even though God has said, no, 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 no. Death is defeated. It's okay. It just looks like death has won right now. 
It in fact hasn't. I've defeated death. How hard is it for us to believe those words? What about when God says you're not alone? You know, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, and, and that's how he came to us at Christmas. And then, and then on Good Friday, he was taken from us, but, but Jesus says, no, 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 I still want to be with you. And so God raises him from the dead so that he can be with us always to the very end of the age, the Bible says. And, and, and so we're never alone, right? It's, it's clear. God spoke that. He says, you, you're never alone. I'm with you. Don't fear. And yet when life gets hard, isn't it easy for us to believe that we're alone, forsaken, not loved, not cared about by anyone, especially God. See, God speaks clearly, and yet we struggle to believe him, not just in things about who God is or, or about realities in the world, but, but, but especially when it comes to what God has said about us as people, the words that God has spoken about us and what our ID, what our identity is. See, God has spoken things about us, but I don't think we believe them. No more than the disciples believed Jesus' words when he said, I'm going to be killed and, and I'm going to rise again. I mean, we just don't even hear them. We don't believe them. Instead, instead, what do we do? We build our sense of identity not on what God has said, but we build our sense of identity on where we grew up. If you're uh, from St. Louis, you know this question. It's really odd to those of us who are outsiders, but it's the great St. Louis question when you meet someone new and you kind of get introduced and you find out they also grew up in St. Louis. What is the question? Do you know? Where'd you go to high school, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, you just validated that. That is, in fact, the question. Um, where we grew up, our family of origin, where we live, what our family was like. So many of us use that as the basis for our identity, don't we? I remember, for me, just, I grew up to a very common family. My parents were not highly educated. They didn't have a lot of money. Um, we, were, we were pretty just simple. And I remember as I, you know, grew up and, and started hanging out with some kids who were kind of different, man, I, I, I was really ashamed about how my family grew up, and I, I wanted to keep all of that from them because I thought somehow that, that that said something about me. Now, of course, I realize that my parents are anything but common now. I mean, they're extraordinarily, extraordinary people. My, my folks are just some of the most uh, creative and gifted people. Um, in fact, if, if there is ever a zombie apocalypse, I'm not betting on it, but if there is one, I've assured my parents that wherever they go, I'm going to be with them because if there's anyone who can live off the grid, it is my folks. <laughs> They're impressive people. <laughs> and yet, how many of us look at our family of origin, where we come from, our, our, our beginnings as the foundation for who we are? Or what about what we do? You know, whether we work outside of the home or we stay home as a mom or, or, or what job we have. And if it's an impressive sounding job or if it's not, we let what we do define so much of who we are. Or what about what we own? Now, this is an expensive path to identity. I'm just going to tell you there are cheaper ways to do this. And yet some of you are hell bent on trying to find your identity in this way. You're, you're buying your way to a sense of self and it's expensive, it's costly, and you're doing it. And so many of us do this in our own ways. Or what we look like. This is what we do when we're young and then we just get to a certain age and we give up on this one because if who you are is pinned on what you look like, just forget it. Let's find something else. So what about people, uh, what about the things that people have said about us? You know, we've all had things spoken about us and maybe there's things that we've hated, things that we've not wanted to believe and yet we've heard them and they've just kind of stuck. And not only have they stuck, but we've begun to build our sense of who we are around those words. They become these, these, uh, these prophecies, these self-fulfilling prophecies. Words that we hate, words that, that we, we, we just are so frustrated about, and yet, and yet we believe them and they become part of who we are. What about the mistakes that we make? Man, we so easily let our mistakes, our sins, and our addictions define us. We become those things. And here's the problem with all of that. These are all like false clues. These are like red herrings that will lead us to a sense of who we are, but it's a false reality. Just like Good Friday for the disciples was this reality embroiled in their mind. It was so real. They watched Jesus die. It was gruesome. It was horrific. And, and they just couldn't imagine that, that they could ever get beyond that. And that's the same thing that happens to us. We build a sense of identity based on all of these things. But it's not true. This is not who we truly are. See, see God has spoken he has spoken words as clear as day that are meant to define who we are, that are meant to be the, the foundation of our identity. 
And yet, we've let so many other things define us instead. Meanwhile, God is speaking, and today I'm going to challenge you to listen to him. First off, he says, we are all sinners. Oh boy, here we go, right? Someone bring in the fire and brimstone, uh, because this is where it gets all ugly. I mean, this isn't why you come to church, right, to hear that you're a sinner. Well, some of you do, but that's just because you've got problems and you're kind of sick like that, I guess. Um, but, but, you know, this, this is true that, that we are sinners. And, and the reason we need to embrace this as a part of our identity is for a reason other than what you might think. It's not so that we can live life in guilt and shame and go around feeling bad about ourselves. No, 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 that's, that's not the purpose. See, I want to show you the purpose. And these are going to be the words from John. John, you know, the fast guy who got to the tomb first. Later on in life, he wrote these words. And he said this, he said, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You got that? If we claim to be without sin, if we claim that we are not sinners, we deceive ourselves, and there's no truth in us. We're we're living a lie. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Do you hear what John says? He says, if you can't own that you're a sinner, you're living in denial. And you're going to live in frustration. You're going to live stumbling over the same parts of your nature over and over again, unsure of why you self-sabotage all of the time. Life is going to be confusing to you. It's going to be frustrating to you. You're going to be a hypocrite to people. You're going to be, you're going to be arrogant to people in your life. People in your life are going to be mad at you. See, I know that some of you in this room, you reject the whole idea of original sin and you get caught up in arguing this, like whether or not Adam and Eve eating fruit that they shouldn't eat can actually cause you to sin. And today I just say, set that aside for a second and just look at your own life. And if, and if you look at your own life and you can't come to the conclusion that you've got sin in your life, then turn to the person next to you who rode in with you today and ask them, I think they will set you straight. <laughs> right? I mean, at the foundation of who we are, there's just this brokenness. We're not right. And the reason we have to acknowledge that is because it's not until we identify as that that we can begin to move beyond it. It's not until we can, can conf- confess our sins, speak with God, and say, God, yeah, yeah, this is who I am. It's not until we can do that that God will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. See, the reason you have to admit this is not, again, so you can go around feeling bad about yourself and guilt and shame. It's so you can get free from it, so you can move on from it, so you can begin to become something else, something else that God has also spoken over you. God has said you're a sinner, but he also says you're a saint. (laughs) Now, some of you are sitting in the room like me right now. If I were you, I'd be like, I'm no saint. Trust me. Because you think of people like Mother Teresa, or you think about the great saints who have lived over time, who have done amazing works, and have been just really noble people, and you go, hey, that ain't me, and you know, that's not me either. But saints simply means holy ones. And I, I want to show you something. Um, Peter, you know, the other guy who was at the tomb? Peter was a guy who I really identify with the more I read about his life, because he was a guy who was passionate and zealous, and yet he made a lot of mistakes. And he let Jesus down in Jesus' biggest moment of need. When Jesus was being arrested and accused, Peter denied that he even knew Jesus three times. And Peter made all kinds of mistakes. And even after Jesus was raised again from the dead and uh, Peter was made a leader in the church, Peter still made all kinds of mistakes. So so Peter was kind of a mess and, and he knew that. But what he figured out is that that didn't define him anymore. When he could admit that he was a sinner, God then called him something else. And, and so I want you to see what Peter then said, not just about himself, but about all of us who are in Christ. He said, but now, you know, whoever you were before, that doesn't matter. But now you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. See, Peter says, you're a sinner, that's true, you've got stuff in your life, but now, because of what Jesus has done for you, God doesn't call you that anymore. God calls you holy, a saint. He calls you chosen. He calls you royal. And I know that might be hard for some of you to believe, but but if, if God didn't have this opinion of you, do you think he would have given his son to die for you? If you weren't his special possession, if you weren't beloved by him, w- would he have given Jesus over to suffer and die? See, I know it's hard for some of us to believe, but God doesn't see all the things that we see when we look in the mirror. And, 
He doesn't see all of the flaws that other people see. But because of what Jesus has done on the cross and in the empty tomb, because Jesus has taken our sin and made us a new creation, given us new life, there is no condemnation for us anymore. That means that as God looks at us, he he doesn't say, man, you're a sinner and you're prideful and you're arrogant and you've got a lust problem. He says, no, 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 no. That's who you were, but now you are chosen and you are royal and you are holy You are my special people. I love you. I know some of you are sitting here today and you're thinking, yeah, but you don't know me really. That's easy for you to say. Some of you are saying, I'm I'm no saint. And some of you are saying, I'm no sinner. And we're everywhere in between. But but let me just remind you of one simple truth that, that I've always taken hold of on Easter. And it just changes my faith. It changes my perspective in life on everything, including my identity. And and here's what I want to remind you of on Easter. Easter means that God gets his way. Easter means that God means what he says. Easter means that God always delivers on his promises. If he can raise a man from the dead in order to keep his promises to people, then what can he do in your life with the words that he's spoken over you? Do you get that? If even death won't stop God from fulfilling his word, And can a messed up childhood, can some unfortunate events that have happened to you over the course of your life, can any of the things that we look to as, as a definition for who we are, can any of those things speak louder than the voice of God? Do any of those things get to win? See, God can redeem any story and he can give it a happy ending. God can make anything new. That's what Easter is about. And and as you live that reality in the world and and you see all kinds of things that aren't right and you say, yeah, but God wins in the end. His word wins. He keeps his promises. Even death doesn't have victory when God has said otherwise. It'll change your life. It'll, It'll change your faith. But it also will change the way you see yourself. See, why not begin living life with what God has said at the basis of who we are? Why not begin living life with what God has said about us, not what other people have said about us, not what our, our, our adjusted gross income, you know, it's almost tax time, or our socioeconomic status, or, or our mistakes, or what other people have said, any of that stuff. Why not begin to live with what God has said about us at the center of who we are? We are. See, that's what we're going to do through the rest of this series. This is just week one of a series. And in this series, we're going to begin to discover and then hopefully live out our God-given identity. But here's what you have to do first, week one. You know, I kind of hope you stay with us the rest of the series. Even if you live out of town, you can track along with us. I think this will change your life if you can finally figure out who you are. Because what do we do starting at age 10 or 11? We start looking for all these clues in life to piece together who we are. And and, and we think about our attractions. We think about our temptations. And we think about who our parents are. And we start to to compose this picture of who we are. But, but, But if we could just instead begin to reject false reality, all of that other stuff that seems so compelling and powerful, Because friends, understand, that's the stuff of Good Friday. It looks powerful, it looks permanent, it looks compelling, and yet God always gets his way. If, If today we could just begin to reject false reality, all of the things that we've believed about ourselves, some are good and some are bad, but reject all of that, the stuff we've believed for decades, or maybe just a few years, if we could reject all of that and start again with what God has spoken about us, what he has said, and we made that the foundation of who we are, we'd be well on our way to living out our new identity as people of Easter, holy, chosen, loved by God. If this is just, and I'm up here talking and it's just kind of not getting through to you today, Maybe this video will help you begin to form who you really are.